My name is Monika Mechkova and I'm kind of involved in some stuff here still. I used to study here a long time ago. But uh, my full-time job is at the University of Sussex in England, uh, on, in the very southern place in England, Brighton. Only if you go further south, it's France that you reach. Uh, and I have been part of a kind of a small a research project here, which is a research project led by students. So today has been organized by our doctoral students, two people in particular, Johanna Kotyshova and Daniela Vajvarova, who are sitting in the audience very modestly. But they have put all of this together, so I would like to thank them to begin with. Uh, I would also like to alert you that we have some issues of our Sociology Studia magazine down here on topics that are relevant for our discussion today. And if anybody would like to pick one up, feel free, free of charge. So our topic today is the refugee crisis, the media in the refugee crisis. I was following the crisis from London and I was getting increasingly more and more desperate with the coverage uh, in Central Europe, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and then I was reading all the Hungarians writing in The Guardian and our Chaba in, quoted in the New York Times. I thought, well, there are some other voices there as well. And the students then kindly said, no, no, you really need to get rid of this whole thing with the coverage. So let's do this wonderful, wonderful event today. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of Chaba's time, but a lot of you will know Chaba. He's our very own head of department of sociology. And uh, you know probably some of his work. But I just wanted to say that one of the things that he has written about a lot is transnational migration. He has a long-standing interest in cultural studies although he is a sociologist, so he also writes about sociological theory quite a lot. But I will hand over to him, and one of the topics that he has been exploring recently is the top of, topic of cosmopolitanism. So I don't know if that will come up in your talk, but uh, I sometimes despair that with the current climate, there's not much hope for cosmopolitanism, so I will just hand over to him. Thank you very much. OK, so I would like to uh, generate, actually, more questions uh, and provide you with any kind of answers. And uh, I will try to be quick, and uh, I hope that we will speak about these issues in a debate. So I'm prepared to debate uh, all of these kind of ideas I will actually push through <coughs> in this 20, maximally 30 minutes. All right, so I will not speak about the actualities of the refugee crisis. I don't want to uh, go into the details. Everyone can follow what's happening. Uh, you can just realize that what is happening in Greece, uh, what is happening in uh, Macedonia, what is happening in Balkan, what is happening all over the these places. I would like to focus more on some kind of uh, perspective through which we are able to understand or misunderstand what is happening around us. So very simply, uh, <coughs> uh, I will present you some keywords uh, and I try to be uh, short. Very simply, we have a very uh, clear picture that migration, recent migration, but we know that not only recent uh, forms brings us instability. That's a very clear argument present everywhere. And there is a very clear argument present everywhere that migration is caused by instability, right? It means that these people are f fleeing their countries because there is some kind of instability. And we can, we can find different kind of arguments whether it's economic, political, environmental, right? You can find all this, all this kind of uh, expert knowledge which will explain you and show you even the numbers that we can have, we can wait for another thousands and hundreds of thousands of refugees because of ecological reasons and others. What is important for us now to somehow crystallize or crystallize our perspective to see behind this purely the movement, movement of people, right? It means that 
we try to, and I, that's what I would like to uh, somehow invite you to translate what we see, right, in media, perhaps, or here, to translate into a, a bit simpler and sometimes a bit more abstract terms. But <clears throat> it's very important to see that we experience, we see that migration always somehow entails experience of movement. Right? The experience of movement results in a kind of explosion, some kind of displacement, not only from territory, but also from the status of migrants. It means that those people who are moving are somehow moved out also from their status, social, economic, political. It means that they bring with themselves some kind of earth uncertainty, what kind of people we are. Right? Uncertainty, what on the sides of those who are waiting for them, or not waiting for them, not that coming, but that there. But also uncertainty on their own side. It means that movement generates instability, not only though in those countries where the refugees or migrants came, right, in this kind of argument, but inside of the migrants, inside of the refugees, inside of us. But it means that very simply we can we can see a movement everywhere, or even new movement, kind of emotional movement inside, right? with, uh, which is important, which is interesting for us. Uh, movement and migration leads to a very famous case. Empirical, everyone knows. Everyone is probably everyone of us saw the movie. Minimum heard about that ship moving. There were also migrants, sure, not only the rich people, but you saw them moving up there, down there, the poor people. Anyway, what is important in this case? Several things which are related to this whole uh, big issue: insecurity. Right? Again, we see that. Actually, the ship in itself was proclaimed to be very secure. We saw that it ended in a catastrophe. In any kind of migration, any kind of movement involves insecurity, which is one of the key words recently, perhaps. But what is important, again, to see that it was in the 10s, 20s, 30s, migration is nothing new, insecurity is nothing new, instability is nothing new, right? In this sense, it's very important to put it into the historical context, into historical kind of uh, <clears throat> milieu, right? To see that what is exactly happening here, right? It means that what is exactly happening in case of refugee crisis, what is exactly ca happening to us and to them, is actually nothing new. It's, I think that it's very important to see that this kind of, and I don't want to now turn to this very simple comparison which was just presented last week in the foreign affairs that actually if you look at the numbers of those who are dying in a car accident is higher than in terrorist cases. We know that this is exactly the point that not the empirical facts and empirical evidence is what is called counting for us. No, the image and the icon of that people in special situations is more important than the number, right? It means that in this case, the ship and sinking and all that stuff is important for us because it represents some kind of dragon of a myth, right? Modernity, etc. Anyway, I don't want to go into that. It's more important that you see, you remember from the movie, you remember maybe from different kind of stories, a band, a music band, playing just even to the last moment, right? Playing out of leaves, or I don't know what kind of music I heard somewhere. I read they were playing a song about out of I don't know. Play. It's very crucial because, from my argument of point of view, it's very important to see that they were somehow consciously generating some kind of mood, right? We are lying, we are trying to escape, but they were, it's a point of reflexivity, again, a fashionable 
uh, concept today, they were reflecting that, okay, we are in some kind of risky situation, but we are serving the others, right? We have some kind of status, we are musicians, we have some kind of responsibilities, we have some kind of faith, we are able to right, accept this faith, and we are playing to the others, we are generating some kind of mood. Mood will be very important because if we speak about media, we know that it's not about information, right? It's partly also about information, partly about representation, but it's very much, for us, for me, uh, if looking for uh, every day in this detailed uh, media representation of refugees crisis, I have a very, very deep, uh, how to say, uh, okay, feeling. It's like an MTV from my childhood. The video clips, music video, right? It's creating mood. That's the very important, I think, and let, let's debate about that. I think that it's very important for me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the whole ship sinking is crucial, not just because of stability, instability, insecurity, but also with some kind of reflexivity of some kind of division of labor, or some kind of persons, and but also the mood and the iceberg. You know, uh, that's a very important uh, theoretical model. You know that the whole catastrophe was caused because of some kind of visibility and invisibility conditions. You see the iceberg, but actually underneath the sea, there is something you do not see. And that's caused the catastrophe of the ship, right? Iceberg actually is a very important theoretical model because actually in, not only in cultural sociology or cultural studies or sociology anywhere, we, we work with this condition of what is visible and what is invisible. And it's very important because usually by means of interpretation, by means of analytical interpretation, critical interpretation, we try to touch what is underneath of the empirically visible structures. Right? And similarly, as in case of refugee crisis, all kind of migration, what is going on? You know, you see something, but actually we do not know what we see, what this, is, what this whole stuff is about. We see the iceberg. Okay, 49 people were sent back from Greece. In the same day, 2,000 people were sent or let, <laughs> uh, opened the gate, actually, in Macedonia. I mean, if you go to... Uh, <clears throat> It was in Iowa's right, in Budapest. You see refugees, some, of, some others see terrorists, the others see human beings. I mean, it's very, very important to see that there is this kind of visibility, invisibility machine, right, behind all that stuff. And we, as social, social scientists or sociologists, try to do something also in this respect. Um, what we see, what is there are two very important uh, categories, conditions, uh, which are behind recent, behind all these kind of representations, not only in media, on, in, but also in academic discourse, when we speak about refugees and migration. There are two very simple. The first is place. The place, place in that sense that <clears throat> place bond membership is assumed as primary as essential, as normal. It means that if we look at some kind of guys coming from, where are coming from, you know, and this is not just about kind of representing them. We deal with them, like you can go into Croatia or Macedonia because you are coming from Syria. How do we know that? Because they have passport, they have some kind of knowledge. The place is important, right? It means it's not just about imagining them, that we are dealing with them. It's a normative regulation, that actions based on this kind of idea, that actually the place bond membership of people is crucial. It's very important where they are coming from. This is deeper, that's the iceberg metaphor. This is deeper underneath our everyday life, meaning structures that we consider this place and placement of people for crucial, right? It means that we are territorializing. But similarly, it means that when someone will then <coughs> claim, like Donald Tusk or, or the others, that, okay, we have to create some kind of 
places where we keep them because we do not know who these people are. But again, the place is there. It's understandable. We are actually working with this kind of territorialization image. Let's close them. Let's do all this kind of territorial stuff forms of social organization. So it's somehow acceptable for us because all kind of discourses, uh, <clears throat> not only media, are working with this kind of normality of place, right? this kind of territorialization. The second is that perhaps state. It means that uh, <clears throat> migrants has been understood always from the perspective of the state in, in, in this uh, <clears throat> Mons and not only into Mons before that. It means that we can see some kind of expulsion also from the state, displacement also from the state's point of view. In the same time, we see that the failed state metaphor played a very important role after the Paris attacks, for instance. But it's very important that it was very few, uh, <clears throat> very few representations where the same concept was applied to Syria and Iraq. They are still, we are still operating with these names, but there are no states for almost 15 years or more in, in these regions. La well, Libya is not a state, right? But still we think as if they were states. We take this as a kind of reference structure, right? Reference structure, the place and the state are some kind of normality. And when we are afraid of something, this is actually, right, at the level of meanings, this kind of instability, I mean, instability in a sense of destabilizing places and states, right? And perhaps that if you look at the uh, different kind of arguments, like Orban and others, they are operating actually in, in, in these discourses and by this kind of anti-nomadic, anti-barbarian, anti-vagabond, right? Arguments, but behind or underneath, there is this kind of idea of normal state functioning. But this is very important to see that from these uh, nomads, barbarians, and vagabonds are usually proletars. And we had a conference just last week here about, uh, what was the name? Uh, Subcontracting migrants. And you can see that not only in Italy, for instance, but in almost everywhere in the South, and not only in the South, a huge proportion of workers in construction industry and, and almost everywhere the proletariat are actually from these countries. Not, not only these, but from the south, even from, <coughs> from Mediterranean, from Africa, from, uh, from Middle East. It means that somehow <coughs> this is also interesting to confront, to see how much is this proletariat image creating proletars from nomads. Or uh, is present or not present in our discourses. Anyway, uh, this brings, and not only just the state, brings me to a <coughs> theoretical model which will somehow try to show us, to reconstruct how it is possible that this place and state works in our uh, social imaginary or in our discourses so strongly. Uh, <clears throat> when we speak about the state, and not only the state, we, uh, can, uh, to we can conceive this from the point of view of the political. It's Karl Schmidt, but not a very uh, kind guy from this point of view, but it's very interesting and useful. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's a ter theoretical model which I think that from the point of view of our recent refugee crisis is very useful to understand what is going on, what kind of machine is actually working uh, not just in behind, but what, of, what is actually this machine we are part of, right? If we speak about media, and not only media, but also social science. Uh, this theoretical model is very simple. It claims that there are some kind of cultural preconditions of politics, right? It means that there are some kind of uh, <clears throat> underneath of the iceberg, right? If you see the iceberg stop, that's a kind of politics we see in everyday politics, but there are some kind of cultural structures underneath. And uh, the most crucial, or not, no, anyway, essential, not essential, one of the key points is that actually there is no politics result or enemy. And I would like to uh, very shortly explain what this category means. 
it's very crucial uh, that it's or an enemy. It's not enemy. It's or enemy. Because from Carl Schmitt's point of view, and it's, that it, it's from the 20s, 30s, right? He's writing this in the 30s, uh, uh, <coughs> Germany, Weimar. Right? Actually, usually, usually Carl Schmitt is presented that this friend's enemy distinction is crucial in politics. In my reading, not the distinction is important. It's not who is with us and who is against us. But who are we? This is the crucial question. And that's the reason why we need to divide and we need more energy. Right? And actually, uh, <clears throat> I want to extend this usual reading, uh, which usual reading is focusing on definition of energy. And I think that it's very important to, to see it's not just to define our energy. We have to deal with this enemy in, in action way. Right? Anyway, I will go uh, through that quickly. It means that friend's enemy distinction is crucial from identity building point of view. That's, a, that's clear, right? Uh, <clears throat> from, from this point of view, uh, and I don't want to cl claim that this is a conservative argument for any kind of this, because you can find it in every kind of politics. Only through this distinction, only through showing who is our enemy does the question of our willingness to take responsibility to our own life arises. This is the crucial point of Karshmi. It means that we need our enemy to mobilize ourselves. Right? It means that uh, <clears throat> we are actually, it's very close to what Georg Lukács is writing about the class consciousness. I don't want to go into that. But actually, this both cases actually works with some kind of false consciousness that we actually are living our everyday life and we do not care actually who we are, we do not care about or what we are doing, we are just living our life. And from, from, the, from this point of view, the political is about showing us that someone is actually against us, someone is our enemy, and therefore we are starting to think about ourselves and starting to do something, right? Perhaps a lot of things what we can do, and a lot of modes how to think about ourselves, but the machine is important for us. I mean, this kind of whole mechanism, right? And this kind of normative, normative idea we find that it's good if people will take responsibility for their own lives, right? Democracy, if you want, right? Uh, <clears throat> It's crucial, and that, this is the point where the media plays very important role. Traditionally, nothing new, right? Categorization, stigma, stigmatization, labeling, all this kind of stuff, right? Enemy is all analysis of racism, works with that. It's actually representing someone as if he would be essentially this and this kind of person. What is important uh, from this theoretical model's point of view? When we speak about or enemy, we speak about categorization, but not only the, only the categorization of the other, but the categorization of ourselves. And we see that this is very important, that it's usually underneath the iceberg stop. But you, sometimes you see, right, Christian Europe, right? Why we don't like these Euro, uh, refugees? What are these kind of people? I mean, when we speak about these barbarians and vandals and I don't know what kind of, I mean, all the pictures you could see, the, 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 uh, the, I don't want to go into details, but you, you could see that if you show that they are leaving uh, some of uh, the presents, uh, you are showing that they are this kind of people, not like us, who are caring about what we got as present. Right? And this is very important. But what is important, that this categorization is not just by words, not just by names, but usually through icons, through visuality, to movies, right? To all these kind of visual images. We all know that. We move, we have to move further because this categorization, and this is also present in Karshmi, also representing a form of existence. It means that it's not just naming, not just labeling. And I think that it's very important for us because this actually is our chance. 
Right? This is actually not only chance from the point of view of analytics, but right? interpretation. But it's important to see that when we speak about the deep politics, when we speak about identity building through or enemy, then this is important to see that this is not, those are not just two names, but two forms of existence clashing. This is perhaps very close to all these kind of ideas in the 30s about Lebensraums and, and collectivities, but not just Nazism, but also communism and, and all this kind of nationalist, racist, everything, right? I'm aware of that, but it's a very important part of the argument and you see that this is arising implicitly recently also in these discourses. They are speaking about forms of life, different categories. The Burka question is the forms of life. The, the human, human rights discourse is about actually the forms of existence, right? as it was called by Karl Schmitt at that time. It means that again, we are not dealing with nothing new. It's from the 30s very clearly set, right? In the sense that we do not need to invent something radically new conceptually. We just have to be aware of all of this kind of stuff which are present. And, and I'm not preaching that it will lead to catastrophe. Like in the 30s, right? No, no, not at all. I'm more optimistic. Okay, then if someone will say, if someone will claim we have to take responsibility for our own life because we have a specific form of existence we want to preserve, we do not need to push into a conservative corner. Right? That's very important. What is this is very important that I'm not trying to uh, appeal, right, in a media discourse from an analytical point of view, from a sociological point of view. This is a logic of having some kind of identity based on awareness, who we are, because we know that someone is against us, right? And it's very, we acknowledge our identity, but this identity is based on some kind of engagement in the world. It means that our identity is not just a kind of sticker, not just a name, but it's based, right, in this logic, on some kind of form of existence. For instance, that we are respect women or respect all people, or hate someone, which is also a part. It's not very fashionable to say that I'm hating someone, but this is also a part of form of existence. And it's legitimate. It's justifiable to hate someone. Why not, right? From a sociological point of view. I know that in recent media it's not so uh, simple, but <clears throat> it's very important this engagement, because from, from the model's point of view, this is what justifies the enemy. Friends relation that perhaps in, in his discourse the enemy is who wants to destroy my form of existence. Right? It means that all enemy is, or enemies are those who want to destroy all forms of existence. Right? And we have to take into our own hands our lives, right? Because we want to preserve our forms of access. Perhaps Darwin is everything is there and beyond, right? But we want to pers we want to preserve our form of existence. But I think that we are not uh, <coughs> necessarily uh, <coughs> have to refuse this kind of thinking. Because this is mythology section. Perhaps also so, but this also creates some kind of field of debate, right? When we can speak about them, we can debating and thinking about okay, but what is actually our form of existence? Well, are we different or not? Is human rights-based institution important for us or not? Is liberal democracy important for or not? Are we Christian-based Europe or liberal-based Europe? That's right, right? It means that I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show that this defining our enemy on the basis of our form of existence and the conflict between forms of existence is not something which is uh, <coughs> analytically uh, refusable. Okay, what we see from the beginning uh, that perhaps this categorization and definition of form of existence is a part of political communication. Um, it means that all enemy building categorization is strategic. Even from political, uh, perhaps uh, in, in, in Karl Schmitt's point of view, it's very clear, and not only from the Nazi point of view. Everywhere, every political communication works with this model, with this machine. 
I mean, you have no political communication with, perhaps you can speak about all enemies in very kind manner. They can be alcoholics or those who are eating their wives, etc. But you always have this kind of machine there. Uh, <clears throat> so it's very important to see. When we speak about the refugee crisis, crisis we see that uh, all of this kind of so-called information and representations which are part of a political communication. Right? All the interviews, all the videos, everything is somehow, and this is actually a theoretical model which takes into consideration that <clears throat> actually political communication is not just representing, it's a form of social performance which is crucial. Building the fans is a part of a political communication, not just a picture of the fans, right? Mobilizing thousands of soldiers is a part of political communication, right? As an action, because it's a part of social performance. And this is crucial, I think, because you see that not, it is not just the one side who are, I mean, similarly as when from Kennedy in Budapest, uh, hundreds of refugees just started to walk, right, to, uh, uh, to Austria. It's also a part of social performance, right? It means that they are doing political communication day, right? It's very hard. Who are they, right? But the political communication, similarly as social performance, is a part of the whole issue. Right? It's not just that some of the bad guys are doing political communication and some of the bad guys are doing social performance. And I think that it's very important that if we are intending or not, but all these kind of media uh, <coughs> performances are part of this whole political communication machine if they want or not. Right? This is a kind of uh, important sociological uh, instance that it's not dependent on our intentions. It can be unintended, right? And we are part of the drama, right? And <clears throat> that's very important to see again, it just in, in a, a, other words, we do not need or we cannot reduce these uh, social performances to speech acts, right? Analytically, it's very important. Speech acts are very important. It's usual that when we marry someone that we say something, this is a speech act, and visually treat that social performances consist first of all from speech acts also, but not only. And I think that this whole refugee crisis showed us very nicely, right? That terrorist attacks, if you kill someone, this is a social performance. Also intended social performance, as we see, right? It means that they can't also with media representation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's exactly what I wanted to uh, stress. Perhaps it's very hard because the similar model works in theory of conspiration, conspiration theories. I mean, sociology, by this model, is very, very close to theories of conspiration, which is full everywhere, right? And uh, <clears throat> it means that we are very, very close to paranoia and schizophrenia in, in, in this representation, representational discourses. It means that I acknowledge or I'm, I'm aware of this. But it's very important to see that if you look again to this iceberg, right, if you see, okay, refugee crisis, it's a kind of iceberg, and we have to go down. And it's very important this, that, that if you follow that, that slowly, uh, also, <clears throat> we can see that these kind of categories, which we usually use for explaining or understanding what, what is happening to us, uh, are not very much working. Norms, right? Typically, Schengen, Dublin, everything. We are doing just what norms require. I mean, it's very clear that it's not the case, right? Norms are instrumental. Perhaps then we can, okay, but we are doing actually, we can understand everything, all that stuff because of interest. Somebody is uh, following the norm, some others not because because of their interests. It's more sociological, right? Not so much naive. So people are fl uh, fleeing their countries because of their interests. And, and let's try to distinguish between those who have economic interests and those who have other kind of interests. But we know, uh, <clears throat> I think that it's very important to see that, and that this is what I tried to offer now, to see that it's not enough. Some, some, some kind of, uh, some parts of the uh, crisis you can inter uh, explain through interest, but I don't believe that we can explain everything through interest. Because this is exactly the, 
field where it's very close to conspiracy theory, and we can see all those who have the interest, it's not necessarily that they also are regulating or doing these things. So again, usually uh, what we have beneath, right? And, and I don't know when, what's the point when we go down to, to, from the at the iceberg's point of view, whether it's a point of interest or the point of identities. I think that there is a very important role identities play also in the building of whole political communication and all those this kind of social performances by trying to reproduce identities and to, to try to create new identities. I think that it's very, very nice uh, from an analytical point of view, nice to see how much it's used to create new political identities on the right, left, etc. The whole crisis. And it's not necessarily intended. It's not exactly the case that someone invented refugee crisis to, in, to create new identities and bring more voters in, right? Like some of the politicians claim that it's a left liberal uh, uh, conspiracy to bring more voters in, for instance, right? But it's important to see that identities are playing a very important role, but not based on identities necessarily essential as natural manner. I want to finish because it's time is going on. The last, what is beneath, underneath the, the iceberg stop are meanings. What I wanted to speak about exactly, I tried to show you that these kind of meanings like the normality of place, normality of state, play a very important role, not only in case of or understanding, but also in case of refugees or all these people's understanding what is happening, what is going on, what is waiting for them, what is happening probably at home. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, perhaps the big normative idea, whether all of that, all of this, what I speak about, is happening in a public sphere, or we are just an audience for political and this is the question, crucial, because this is exactly a question of the possibility, whether there is at all any kind of possibility to debate, to be in a dialogue about what kind of form of existence is important for us, and what kind of form of existence is exactly really poor enemy, right? Or we just accept the screening and accept all these kind of uh, offers uh, in different kind of media channels which actually tell us who are we and who are our enemies. And again, I think, uh, I don't want to uh, be in this kind of very extreme skepticism, but I have a feeling like a, the, the band playing the music, right? And sometimes I feel that instead of public sphere, we have exactly a lot of political communication, a lot of music, entertaining to us, and entertaining us, and having in a kind of mood following the drama. Thank you very much. So we have a little bit more time uh, for some questions, but we will just sit down, I think, it's a little bit more, more friendly. So, so I managed to, to unpack loads and loads of So Java managed to unpack, I think, a lot of the sociological thinking, and we will go on with the public sphere. We will go on with what kinds of debates we have in the media and what influences that after the coffee break. But we have time for some questions. You can try and provoke. Java is used to being provoked, so. <laughs> If you don't do it, I will. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your little lecture. Uh, I have to say that it stimulates my hunger for knowing. And really, it's, there, there were more questions and answers, as, as you promised. And uh, so I'm not satisfied. I can't do it with that. But it's probably good as a, as a keynote to start like that. Uh, you mentioned the metaphor iceberg. And I would like to ask you, how, as a sociologist, would some of you, how would you like to study this iceberg, like, not to and disentangle it like a very complex thing, but to really go uh, deep in some focused way? For example, 
the whole migration thing here has some, has some causes which generates a lot of waves in social reality. You know, the lecture was really about what are the waves here. But in that wave, there is some movement of people. And uh, how, can we, how can we study this, this private cause, this movement of people concerning our methods and our methodology? And how would you exactly do that? What is your pressing uh, topic in your mind? How to study it? But where do we start? I think that we do not need to start. We are doing it for decades and decades. Right? I, I, again, maybe it's, a, it's not a skepticism, it's an optimism. I mean, there is nothing new, really nothing new. We all know about these issues for decades. Right? I mean, there are internationally based research networks dealing with migration, and not only transnational migrations, for decades and decades. We do not need to do anything. I mean, we have the methods, we have the researchers, we have everything, but no one cares, for, us, for instance. I mean, in Hungary, until August, last year, until August, there were 40,000 migrants, illegal migrants, crossing the borders, moving through the country. No one knew about that. No one cared, right, for instance. What happened, right, in August, it was 60,000. It means that, okay, and, and that this is a question of evidence, right? Sure, it's very, very important to have an empirical evidence, but it's not enough, right? It means that I think, very, to make it very simple, I mean, we have uh, <clears throat> all these means to understand it, we have all these explanations and theories. For instance, very, to be very concrete, it was in April, it means that uh, very early, when uh, one of the crucial think tanks of European Commission, personally subordinated to Juncker, published for the Commission a very short, just four page, but it's behind hundreds of pages of work, uh, report on migration. Right? No one cared about that. It was published there, and it was very clearly written what is coming on, what is going on, right? In, it means that, uh, not because someone had some kind of secret information, no. Uh, or no, it's just enough to su see what kind of right information and what kind of uh, academic and non-academic work is done in the field of migration studies and anthropology and, and other other things. And uh, perhaps what's important that there is a dispute and there is a disagreement. It means that it's not so simple that someone will come and say, right, this is these are the causes, and everyone will agree. Right? It's a kind of academic debate, and perhaps a lot of books were published, a lot of research done, and there is, a non, there is non, uh, no substantial consensus on that. But this is how it works. But these persons, these guys, and it was one of the first things that the new head of European Commission did, but it's, that he created an expert unit, right? which deals with not just the migration, several issues. And, 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 and he, or the Commission, receives these expert-based uh, papers regularly. Uh, so the knowledge is there. Uh, but that's very important to see where is actually exactly the place of this knowledge. And uh, it forms a part, a very tiny part of this whole political communication machine. Right? And sometimes you need these evidences, and sometimes you do not need these evidences. Right? It, this is exactly what I wanted just to uh, hint on. Can I follow up? <coughs> so you say there is knowledge, uh, let's say, in quantitative statistical knowledge of the diversity, of the social diversity of the movement. Yes, the I mean, there are quantitative, qualitative, anthropological, medical, all kind of knowledge which deals with African, South American, I mean, what was happening in, in the, not just in Europe, right? The, so the Mexican migration or the whole Latin American migration to the United States. I mean, these are issues which are very, very much present in not only academic uh, fields, uh, very much studied, and, uh, and the organizations and political organizations and not only uh, human, right, humanitarian organizations which are dealing with these issues and, the, for instance, in the camps in Jordan. I mean, the European Commission has its own units 
which are visiting almost every month the camps in Jordan the last three years. I mean, for them, it was nothing new what happened, right? And perhaps from April, a lot of informations were not only gathered, but also in academic field and other fields that there are changes, for instance, like uh, you could read about this, changing the character of this uh, uh, transportation from one kind of boats to other kind of boats. It means that all these kind of informations are present, all these kind of informations can be used. Right? The question is, and this is when I was speaking about the failed states argument, that, for instance, we can understand the whole procedure and what is happening, or the whole movement, what is happening, for instance, uh, I don't know, from May, minimally from August, as a kind of political communication, as a big social performance to manage the failed states. Because if you are not able to build the camps, if you want, then you are a failed state from this point of view. Right? If you know that there were hundreds of thousands or minimally tens of thousands of people crossing your country, but you are not preparing the institutions to deal with them, then we can treat this also as a failed state. Not only the case of Belgium, it was used for Belgium, but there were four guys or nine guys, or I don't know, but 17 guys who were terrorists, and you didn't know about that, so you are a failed state. But you are not able to prepare an infrastructure Right? then you can be also treated as a failed state. But uh, perhaps, uh, who knows? So this kind of uncertainty uh, is present also in, in our side, because we do not know uh, exactly what is happening. Also in, in our side, we do not know what is happening. Not only in, or in the case of refugees, right? We, we think that we do not know who are these people. But actually, we do not know what is happening in Germany, because not just because we are not reading about that, but we do not know what is underneath of this iceberg. There are a lot of paranoid conspiracy theories. They need this because of the labor force. They need this because of the maybe, I don't know. Any more questions? Yes, please. Thank you for the yeah, we do have some microphones again, which I completely forgot about. This is the chair's fault. I should have delegated this to someone. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in your speech, you speak a lot uh, about a mood that uh, media coverage of uh, these events creates some mood. I do agree, and I think that your presentation also generates some mood. Uh, maybe because of the metaphor with uh, Titanic and iceberg, I feel I judge as it as a mood of a twilight, a dusk, the end of civilization. <laughs> we Europeans on the boat uh, leading the iceberg, but at the same time, you stress that you are optimist, and I have. It sounds a bit contradictor uh, contradictory and I have two interpretations, possible interpretations. The one is that you know the solution, how to pass the iceberg, or the second, which uh, I think is more pro uh, probable, you claim that uh, the forms of existence of our society uh, don't change, it means they are reproduced in the state of permanent treat, in the state of emergency, like leading to iceberg. Is that what you want to, and that's why we shouldn't be worried about the current situation so much, because it's nothing new, as you said. Is that what you want to say with this uh, metaphor and model? Iceberg? Something similar. I think that it was very, for me, it was very important and, uh, in, from August, or I mean, in these months, that there were ordinary people who were just helping the other human beings. Right? This is very, very important. Because for me, it was an evidence that there are utopian promises living in these societies. It means that we are not just skepticals, pragmatics, uh, etc., right? who are just want to live or nice life based on mortgage and consumption and all that stuff. Right? 
And this is, this is the basis of my optimism. Because I think that the part of our form of existence, what I think that this is liberal democracy in some sense, right? It means that I, I cannot imagine, uh, but it's more politics, but I'm not, not a political, I, not that I cannot imagine European Union without Louis Frank of stuff, right? And, and liberalism in a political sense. But this kind of freedom based enlightenment, all that stuff, it means that we have our own tradition. Yes, sure. And actually, I know my enemies. I will, and it's not the question whether it will be Muslim or not Muslim. I cannot imagine that I will support people who will deny the freedoms of my daughter because of her gender. That's very clear. Similarly, I don't like those who are not liberals in the freedom sense, not economic sense. Right? And, and this is very important to try to debate about, to tell, right? Yes, sure, I'm very much for multiculturalism, and that's all right. And but, right, there are some kind of symbolic boundaries that I don't want to cross. Right? But this is the utopia of, utopia of public sphere, right? That we can speak about that and not just putting clicks, right? And just supporting my hatred of those or hatred of that, right? It means that uh, this is actually, uh, I think that. Uh, there is a very, uh, how to say, in, not only in media, not only in academia, but it's very, it's also legitimate. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, it's not possible, but we have an extreme skepticist, scientific based culture, right? We have very extremely skepticism, skeptics of everything, right? But I think, and again, I'm just starting to repeat myself, for my, my, myself this summer was important to see that still we have utopian promises. And this is very good for me as a cultural sociologist, because cultural sociology say that we are not actually necessarily acting because of our interest, because of our reason, but we have some ideals, right? And, and, and I think that if we have we share some kind of ideas, and we will in in the case we will be able to debate, to be in dialogue with also others who have their own ideas, then maybe. If I can just chip in a bit, uh, we had this whole kind of media performance stuff going on, and you very well know that the Britain is very much a Eurosceptic country. A lot of the stuff that is going on has been historically caused by them, but they're trying to say, no, we're not interested in any of this, we're not dealing with it. So uh, the Prime Minister agreed to take in 20,000 Syrian refugees. Within two days, he had to change his mind because there was a petition with about 5 million people signing it. So now it's 40,000 people, and he immediately flew straight to Lebanon to spend some time with the Syrian children in a refugee camp. So there is this, we are very skeptical, we are very analytical, we can be very cynical, but actually there are some bits of hope, even in this very emotional, kind of emotionally charged public sphere, emotionally charged debates, because again, these traditions were not based on rational arguments, they were not about this is how much it is going to cost the UK, this is why it's best, this is a SWOT analysis, you know, it wasn't based on that, it was these are children who are suffering, let's help them. So I think I, I, I'm very skeptical as well, because we are proper scientists. We can't be, you know, we can't be optimistic as scientists. We have to deal with that. I think we have a, maybe time for two more quick questions. Yes, please. Just. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you about the uh, polarization our society, that's what I see the biggest problem, uh, where the biggest problem is, uh, because uh, we like don't have, uh, especially in the Republic, we don't have such a big issue with refugees because there are not so many coming here, but we have the big issue of not being able to deal with it and not being able to even debate in our society because there is a big gap between you know, people pro and against. And uh, is there any like uh, solution to this? How the media should cover it so that uh, the both sides are able to listen to each other, or kind of create any consensus? So, uh, how to deal with this problem? I see it as something very different from other issues because you know even the groups that were like uh, that had like. Um, 
for example, I don't know, environmentalist uh, uh, inside uh, uh, in their own ranks, there is a big uh, diversity of uh, you know and diversity of uh, opinions. So the people that were uh, in other cases in agreement now they are dividing and they are uh, having a big struggles to communicate with each other. So what is, uh, how to deal with this? To find your common enemy. <laughs> but seriously, I think that, uh, again, from, from, from my sociological point of view, that stability is a myth, right? Consensus is also always temporary. And, uh, and there is nothing wrong, or not in the sense, nothing pathological in conflict and in diversity of opinions, right? The trouble is when... Uh, there is an impossibility to mobilize for some kind of common issue, right? But it means, again, to, to make it, make it a, a bit of fun, that there is no real enemy broadly against whom to unite. It means that the whole conflict is not so uh, important. We will talk a bit more after the coffee break about the role of the media, and I, I also, I always hesitate because it's so easy to blame the media and I teach students of journalism so I always try to tell them that it's not your individual fault, you know, you're not individually perpetuating but as Cheva was talking about the political machine, we will be talking about the media machine, what it is that actually restricts what gets into the media and how that is shaped. And I think you are right, I also think that we have still have a big generational divide where young people are discussing things on the social networks and older generations are discussing things in pubs or over coffee and they just somehow don't cross the lines and I think this is another issue that we're dealing with. The last question, if there is one, I'm not trying to put pressure. Yes, brilliant, thank you. I wanted to uh, get your opinion on uh, whether or not you could see your iceberg as, in fact, capitalism itself. And in a Marxist view, uh, implement the uh, Wallerstein model that this constant movement between the capital and the labor and the resources um, that is the basis of colonialism for the last 500 years which has destabilized and exploited these faraway places where the resources are, and, not, and there have been cases where we've imported the labor as well from Turkey, and now it's coming home to roost, as we say. And, but it always has, I think, been an issue for these places and caused movement of people. And um, the media's role, I think, has exacerbated it now in the 20th century, whereas before, it really wasn't a role, but it's in fact facilitated it so that now refugees can come, they can learn about what's going on and how to move and things. And it sensationalized it here and abroad and um, made it more difficult for solutions to be rendered. And I also wonder if then when we look at the media now and the structures of media that we can't really change the reason why media exists and who are the people it serves, whether it's commercial or public service, they have masters to serve. Um, is it more about media literacy that the receivers now need to take it amongst themselves to participate and understand and demand information as opposed to sensationalism and entertainment? Yes and no, because you know uh, I think that uh, in, in my understanding, I mean from a cultural sociological point of view, that this underneath is not generating cause of it. It means that it's not something which determines what is at the top, right? It's more, it's a kind of concealment, right? We don't, I mean, this is not invisible. It's not necessary that what is invisible that has a force, right? It means that this is what, for me, leads more to conspiracy. From a I mean, it, it, you are right in a sense. If I translated this Marxist argument from capitalism to power structures, then it will be more acceptable for me, right? It means that, but, but capitalism is one form of 
social organization. There were always some kind of forms of social organization, even in times of Roman Empire, etc., etc. Et they were always these kind of movements of people. But right? even the Hungarians came here, right? It's the basis of national mythology, right? It means that. And, but this is a reason why I think that for me the part of these power structures are also meanings and identities. I cannot reduce it just for the material forms of, uh, I don't know, who owns something, right? It means that the ownership in itself is somehow also cultural. I'm not a cultural determinist, but I think that these things uh, for me uh, to, in, in analytical terms, make sense for in this kind of Foucauldian popular knowledge nexus, where we always have to have and always have some kind of social organization which is always temporary and based on hierarchies. And usually they are violent, killing people. At a, and, and what I don't think that uh, this is missing in all recent world. Perhaps all recent world is very, very violent. Also, I mean, inside of Western world, right? It means that you are right in a sense that if we see again some kind of underneath structures, let's call them capitalism or let's call them something different, then they, their role is very important. It's very nice. I mean, it's very important also to see, right, what kind of working conditions are in South Italy for those who are picking the tomatoes and we are eating them and buying in a villa because they are nice, fish shaped, red, etc. Et right? so, so in this sense, this is also for me a logic of visibility and invisibility. We do not see this worker from Africa working in, in South, South uh, <coughs> Italy, but it's not necessarily uh, a code of capitalism. Also, capitalism also, but not just this, I think. I'm really sorry, but we will have to finish here, and there are refreshments outside, I believe, and the next session starts in about 25 minutes. But can we just thank Chapa again for taking the time to talk?